Uh, today we're going to interview uh, retired Colonel David Ingram of the U.S. Marine Corps and get him to tell us about his experiences uh, when he was in the Marines. We'll start, David, by talking a little bit about maybe your, your early uh, background, where you came from, your family situation, and up to until you join the Marines, and then we'll talk okay. about why you joined the Marines and take it from there. So talk about your, uh, your early background. Okay, I, I'm the uh, son of a World War II veteran. I was born when he was in the Pacific in World War II in the Army. He was a, a lieutenant in the Army. And um, my mom was a registered nurse. She was from uh, near Chicago, Illinois, and he was a Florida boy. And um, so she went home to her parents' home to have me in Kankakee, Illinois, which is just south of Chicago. So I was born there. I lived in my grandparents' home for my first year until the war ended. And my dad came back from the war, and then he took us to Florida. But I grew up in a small town called Stark, Florida. And uh, it's in a rural part of Florida. And uh, I lived... Uh, a wonderful life as a kid. It was post-World War II, Camp Blanding, a large military training base was located nearby, about six miles outside town, and so Stark was recovering from that. It was kind of a town where a lot of soldiers went. A block from our little home there was a bar, and as a little boy my best friend and I used to go into that bar uh, against our parents' wishes and buy a, for 15 cents a Coca-Cola and a pack of peanuts. And the man named Cy, who ran the bar, my mother was convinced was a drug addict. He looked terrible. He looked on the verge of death the whole time. But we would go in and, and I remember the floor of the bar smelled like sour beer. And we would sneak in and put the peanuts in our Coca-Cola and drink our Coca-Cola and, and compare the bottom of the Coca-Cola bottle to see who, whose Coke was made the furthest away. And so uh, the only military I was exposed to was the Florida National Guard, of which my father was a member. And I went to a small school from kindergarten all the way up through the 11th grade and my parents moved to Tallahassee, a much larger town. But I was in school with the same group of, of uh, children my whole career almost, my whole secondary school career. And um, I remember seeing a movie called The D.I. with Jack Webb. And it was about Marine Corps recruit training, and that intrigued me. And then my father and I would go we take a boat and fish off of the, we take the boat out the St. John's River into the Atlantic and fish sometimes. And we did that one afternoon and there was a, an aircraft carrier tied up at Mayport. And it had a sign on the side that said open house. And so my dad and I went aboard the aircraft carrier and on the deck there was the Marine detachment. And I was, about 13 or 14 years old at the time. And uh, there was a Marine lieutenant in his dress blues with a sword in front of a platoon of Marines. And after seeing that movie and seeing the Marine, it just made it an impression on me, a very positive impression. And I thought that would be really an exciting thing to do someday. So uh, that went away. So the years went by and uh, my father was a University of Florida graduate. He wanted me to go to the University of Florida, and I did. And so uh, I wasted a lot of time in a fraternity. My grades were mediocre, but I did not flunk out. I got my associate's certificate from the University of Florida. But my parents lived in Tallahassee. And so I thought it prudent to uh, transfer to Florida State and finish there. I would eat my mother's cooking and have a car. It would be a little 
a little smarter to say, and my grades went up too. But when I was at Florida, these were the years of the draft, and ROTC in college was mandatory, and I didn't like it. I wanted to just wear my regular cool college boy clothes. And uh, so I had to put on a uniform every Thursday along with thousands of other uh, young men and go out and drill, which I did not like at all. So I came back the sophomore year, and one of my fraternity brothers had a really close haircut. He was suntanned, and his name was Billy Joe McCabe. I said, Billy Joe, what did you do this summer? He said, well, I don't have to take ROTC anymore. I joined the Marine Corps. I'm in a Marine Corps officer program. I'll be commissioned when I graduate. I said, how did you do that? And uh, he said, well, there's a Marine Corps recruiting office in Jacksonville. You just go up there and walk in the door and you'll be exempt from uh, ROTC. And you'll be commissioned when you graduate. So I got on a Greyhound bus on a Saturday morning, went up to Jacksonville. I walked into the Marine Corps recruiting office. There was an old master sergeant sitting there. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I'm interested in being a Marine Corps officer. And uh, now in those days, things were a lot less formal. And he said, did you play sports in high school? And I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, is there anything wrong with you? I said, no, I have all my teeth and uh, I can see. And he gave me an eye test. And then he gave me a test called the GCT, the General Classification Test, basically an IQ test. And he hand graded it. It took a couple hours to take it. He hand graded it. And he said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, I think I do. And he said, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States? He swore me in the Marine Corps on the spot. So uh, he said, we'll be contacting you. Go back to school. So. Uh, I walked out, and these are in the days before, pay, uh, before cell phones. I got on a pay phone. I called home. My dad answered the phone. He said, where are you? I said, I'm in Jacksonville. He said, you should be in Gainesville at the university. What are you doing in Jacksonville? I said, I just joined the Marine Corps. He said, you did what? <laughs> and uh, this was July the 12th, 1965. In April of 1965, the first Marines had gone ashore in Vietnam. So I, I joined the Marine Corps just at the start of the Vietnam War. And uh, I, I told my father, don't worry, I'm going to graduate. I'll be commissioned when I graduate. That's what that, that means. He still wasn't too keen on it. So after two years at the University of Florida, I transferred to Florida State. I got away from the fraternity uh, environment. I was a biology major. My grades went up. I was making really good grades. And I took a physics class as a, a first semester senior, required physics class. And there was a lab on Friday afternoons, a three-hour lab. I was paired up on the first day of class with one of the three girls who took the class. And uh, we became very good friends. We never dated the whole semester. At the end of the semester, I had nothing to do on a Friday night. I invited her to go to a movie. And um, on the second date, I asked her to marry me. And we are approaching our 48th year of marriage. So we were very poor. We lived in married housing at Florida State University. Uh, she graduated the quarter before I did and worked and supported us. And then when I was, uh, when I graduated, I was commissioned by a former Marine who was, happened to be the Secretary of Agriculture of the state of Florida at the ceremony. He was the speaker. And uh, I had a 1966 Mustang. We loaded all our belongings in our car and we headed for Quantico, Virginia where the six-month officer school was located. So that was my beginnings in the Marine Corps. Um, I had done well in the platoon leaders class program the two summers I went, and so they offered me a regular commission. And so I 
accepted the regular commission. I don't know why I accepted the regular commission. It sounded better, USMC versus USMCR. That's the thinking of a 22-year-old. So I um, went through the six-month basic school course with uh, 180 other lieutenants, and um, it was time to choose a specialty. I wanted to be an infantry officer. My wife wanted, she said, why don't you do something a little less dangerous? And so I listened to her. I've always listened to her. It's a very wise thing to do. And uh, I chose artillery. So I became an artillery officer. And then after the officer course at Quantico, they sent those of us who were going to be artillery officers, about 10 of us, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That was the Army Artillery School. So we went through about a three-month course there. And then uh, now we're approaching, we're in the middle of 1968 now, approaching 1969. So we're at the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, there was actually a backlog of artillery officers in the Marine Corps going to Vietnam. So I was sent to Camp Lejeune just for a few months. And uh, they immediately put me on a ship and we, would, we did landings down in Puerto Rico. So that was my kind of first thing in the Marine Corps. Then when I got back, I was a regular officer, so they sent me en route to Vietnam to a school called Artillery Survey Officers Course, course where you learn how to actually conduct surveys using maps and instruments and everything. So uh, during this time, my wife became pregnant with our first child. And uh, so I went to Vietnam. She was about seven months pregnant. And I didn't see our son until I came back from Vietnam. So went to Vietnam, and that was kind of a surrealistic experience. They um, actually, the most frightening thing the whole year, including getting shot at and everything else, was seeing my mother at the airport, who was a stoic. She was an emergency room nurse. One time, she rarely, I rarely saw her cry, but she. Um, she was very emotional. So I got on the plane. I went, boy, this, I might, it is possible I won't come back. So uh, I don't remember much about the, the uh, trip, but we ended up in Okinawa. We packed up all our uh, non-essential gear and put it in a storehouse. And they gave us uh, the equipment we need for going into Vietnam. So we. We went in, and I went into the 1st Marine Division headquarters and saw a couple of guys I had known. And they sent me down to the southern part of the Marine Area of Operations. I was in 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines. And they needed a lieutenant at uh, a 4.2-inch mortar battery. And so I went down, and the battery commander was a 1st Lieutenant, and I was a 2nd Lieutenant. And uh, I was a battery executive officer. And we were beside at a, uh, a really big fire support base on one side of a runway. So um, the battery was in, in real need of some leadership. So we, we kind of got the battery in pretty good shape. Um, we would be shot at occasionally, but nothing too terrible, mainly uh, Snipers would shoot at us, and they would sh occasionally shoot mortars at us and rockets, but nothing too frightening. It wasn't too bad. So uh, that young battery commander, who I'm still communicating with, by the way, today, is uh, mayor of a small town in Texas. I think he just finished being the mayor of a small town in Texas. Um, we communicate. We got an older captain in, and... Uh, I didn't really get along with him very well. I was used to kind of running the battery for this other lieutenant. The captain kind of came in, did things his own way. So I volunteered to go out as a forward observer with a rifle company my last three months. I knew I was going to be, I was a regular officer. If I was going to make it a career, I had to do something. 
to get some experience. So I went out and um, they flew me into a rifle company. I replaced a lieutenant who had been there a long time. And I had a Ford Observer mission. I had my pack. Uh, I had two radio operators and a scout sergeant, and that was it. And we were with the rifle company. So when the company moved, and uh, the company commander was very glad to see me. I mean, because I meant artillery support for him. And he was, uh, his name was Joe Williams. He had, he was on his second tour. He had been wounded his first tour. And um, walked with a slight limp. But he, uh, he was really a great guy, a graduate of Vanderbilt. And uh, so we had the three rifle platoons, the weapons platoon, and then I was the uh, forward observer with my team. And I had one scout sergeant and my two radio operators. So when the company moved, one of us would be behind the lead platoon. So he would do it on even days, and I would do it on odd days. We took turns. And so if the company encountered something, the forward observer who would be up front would call an artillery fire or do whatever he had to do. But that was a pretty exciting experience. Uh, I went a month one time without taking a bath or shower. We, if you wore regular underwear, you, you got uh, fungus infections because you were so filthy. So we, know, we wore no underwear, we just wore a t-shirt with our utility trousers. And uh, bacteria on your body got a little, a few open sores and things. But we always took our our uh, anti-malaria tablets. It was a Primaquine tablet. Uh, it gave you the runs for about a day, but that was better than getting malaria. So I would line my uh, three Marines up, and I would pretend I was a Catholic priest. I would administer the sacrament to them, <laughs> give them a pill, and I'd watch them take it, and then wash it down with a canteen of water. But we didn't. We never got malaria. Um, it was pretty exciting being with a rifle company because we moved a lot, we were on helicopters a lot, and we, we went way out west toward the Laotian border, and uh, I shot a lot of artillery. I never saw more than about 35 Viet Cong in one place through my binoculars. And, I, and that, was, uh, that was the exception, the 35 I counted going through a clearing and shot three artillery batteries at them. And um, also uh, we were in a lot of small ambushes. We would ambush them. We didn't get ambushed very often. We were pretty good. The, greatest threat to us were uh, mines and booby traps. And you had to be very careful because they would put a, the VC would take a hand grenade that they had found unexploded and um, put it in a sea ration can and tape it to a tree or something and then stretch a fishing line across a trail. And they would pull the pin on the hand grenade, but it wouldn't go off because the lever wouldn't rotate. So the first guy in the, who was the point man, if he wasn't careful, he would uh, trip that wire and pull the grenade out and you'd have three or four Marines either killed or wounded. So we had a few of those. Um, it was pretty exciting and I kind of got, I, I have to say that I got to the point where I really enjoyed it. I had no responsibilities in the world. I didn't worry about getting paid. Food was brought to us in the form of sea rations. We, we tried all different kind of combinations of mixing our sea rations up. And as long as you had some McElhenney hot sauce, you were okay. <laughs> and um, a treat each day was brushing your teeth and um, making a, a little can full of coffee that you drink. That was about it. That was the highlight of the day. And we did a lot of moving around at night. We didn't get a lot of sleep. Um, pretty exciting, but I came really attached to the Marines and to Captain Williams 
I was, I really thought I was his right-hand man. I, and there was sort of a strange phenomenon that took place. I knew I had a beautiful young wife at home with a son, but when it came time to go home, I didn't want to go. I mean, it was very strange. It was a little bit like the Stockholm Syndrome where you associate with someone. And I felt like I was deserting all the Marines I was with. It was, I was going to leave them and go home. Uh, but I did go, of course, eventually. But the, uh, one of the more humorous events that occurred, we would move into position at night, and we were in the mountains on ridge lines, and it was difficult to tell which ridge line you were on. These are in the days before GPS. And so uh, we thought we were on one heavily wooded ridge line, but in fact we were on the next one. And so my normal operating procedures each night was to shoot in uh, one or two rounds of artillery so I could, if we were hit, I could shift fires from that target rapidly. I wouldn't have to call in grid coordinates. I could just say, okay, from target one, move such and such. And so uh, it was getting dark. The company commander had to go to the bathroom. And in order to do that, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we dug a little cat hole and you just squatted over a cat hole. And um, so he was off in the bushes and it was just about dark. And the only artillery that could reach us was the 155 millimeter howitzer battery, which is a pretty long range. And uh, we were on this mountain, this hilltop, almost a mountaintop. And so I called the battery up and I gave them at my command, which means they're not going to fire until I tell them to fire. And they were firing white phosphorus, two white phosphorus rounds, one round from two guns, and a 200 meter height of burst over the point that I had designated, which was actually where we were. It's, I thought it was on the next ridge line. It was about 500 meters away. So it was really quiet. All the Marines were kind of digging in. It was really quiet. And so uh, I said, well, let's go. Fire. So I hear way off in the distance. And in artillery, if you hear the, the cannon go off, you know it's coming in your direction. The round is subsonic unless it's a gun. So you hear the, the, the round being fired. I heard a boom, boom, like that. And uh, I said, well, I know it's going to be near us. And you could hear the rounds coming through the air. And they got louder and louder. And then some Marine yelled, incoming. And there was a lot of cursing. Guys are jumping in holes. And uh, the rounds went off right above our heads. And fragmentation from these big WP rounds was pretty dangerous. It went whizzing through all the bushes and everything. Nobody was hurt. But my company commander came out of the bushes pulling up his trousers and said, and, and my nickname was 6-1, that was my call sign. He said, 6-1, thanks a lot. I was constipated. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was the big joke. So I was unpopular for a while. But after a while, I got pretty confident and uh, I think pretty proficient too. But the, I got sick once the, my pack rubbed a sore on my back, and uh, I, my temperature shot up to about 103. The Navy corpsman with us took my temperature, and he said, uh, we're just going to medevac you, and they'll clean that out and get you back here. So I crawled onto a helicopter that landed, and they took me back and, and swabbed out the wound and gave me a penicillin shot, and I slept on a bed for the first time in a couple of months. And I got up the next morning, and the doctor said, how do you feel? I said, well, I feel pretty good. He said, get your pack on and go back out there. So I went back out. It was fine. Uh, but it was, it was quite an adventure. And uh, I remember leaving and one of my radio operators, a young kid from Ohio, a little short guy, uh, said goodbye and gave me the peace symbol of his hand. I got on a helicopter and flew back. And it was kind of reverse culture shock coming back to the United States. I remember putting on uh, 
flying to Okinawa and taking a shower and then going into downtown Naha, which was kind of Americanized at the time, and going into an American-style restaurant where there was, uh, they had American-style food, and I ordered a cheeseburger with everything on it, French fries with ketchup, and uh, Coca-Cola with ice, and it was still the best meal I've ever had in my life. Then I went to a Japanese steam bath, and I was so dirty that I could just uh, wet my finger and rub it on my arm, it would be two shades lighter. It just ground in dirt. So I went to a Japanese steam bath and got all washed and sweated out and everything, and I was really clean after that. Came back and about two days later caught a flight back to the United States. And that was a long flight from Okinawa back to the U.S. Is, it must be at least 20 hours, I don't know. But we landed in Hawaii, we landed in Guam, we landed in Hawaii, and then we uh, flew into, uh, what was the name of the, there's an Air Force base near Los Angeles. I can't remember the name of it. We flew in there and got on a taxi with a major. March Air Force Base? No, it wasn't March. Um, and that was terrifying. I hadn't been in a real vehicle for a year, and we were on the, the L.A. freeway with this Mexican driver driving like crazy. It was, it was a little unnerving. Got to the airport. I was in my Marine Corps uniform with the Marine Corps ribbons on and uh, walked down the concourse, and there was a, uh, a rather chubby fellow sitting at a bar. He said, did you just come from Vietnam? And I said, yes, I did. He said, drinks around the house. And so uh, I, I had an empty stomach. I drank two gin and tonics, and I was feeling no pain. And uh, I kept looking at my boarding pass to see where the I was having trouble finding the gate. But And I hadn't slept for the whole flight over. And I looked around. All the people were so well-fed, and the streets were so big, and it was like, a real culture shock coming back because all the people in Vietnam were very small. There were just little tiny dirt paths and uh, it was a, a real strange sensation coming back. And uh, so caught a flight here to Atlanta. You know what they say, you know, you can't go to hell without flying through Atlanta first. So that was the case and then caught a little flight down to Tallahassee and my, my dear wife and our son were at the airport. She wanted to be, she didn't want all the parents around. So, uh, and he was very, uh, he didn't like to go to men. He liked his mother and his grandmothers and he would put up with my father. How old was he? He was uh, about 10 months old. And so, um, these are, we're in the days before TSA, so they could meet the when, meet you when you got off the plane. So I saw him, and uh, he looked at him, and I looked at me. I looked at him, and he looked at me, and um, I said, "Well, give them to me." And uh, he looked at me and put his arms up. But somehow I knew I was his dad, and so we stayed at. I had 30 days leave, so we stayed at my mother-in-law's house, and she lived right across the street from a golf course in Tallahassee. And so I put him in a backpack, one of those little youth child backpacks. I was used to carrying a pack, and I walked 18 holes. He went to sleep in the backpack. That was kind of the way we got to know each other. He's 45 years old and teaches at a university in Ohio now. So that's the way we got to know each other. And then it was the kind of second part of the Marine career I went back and um, they assigned me back to Fort Sill as an instructor for three years. And so I went back to Fort Sill and learned an awful lot about artillery. Then after that, I, they sent me to Camp Lejeune as a battery commander. So I, I had a year as a battery commander and then I was a ops officer for the battalion. And then um, it, this was after the 1973 Middle East War. And uh, I got a call from headquarters of the Marine Corps saying, we're going to send five Marine officers to work for the United Nations. And 
you're not going to be armed. You're going to be working in the Sinai or the Golan Heights, working for the United Nations. You'll have a UN uniform. And so I, w I got briefed in Washington, D.C., and I flew over with another officer over to the Middle East. We, we went to New York, to the UN in the New York, and got briefed. And we flew over to Israel. And uh, we uh, worked. We would patrol the UN disengagement zone between the Israelis and the Egyptians, and between the Israelis and the Syrians. And you'd be out for four days at a time. You had a white, uh, either a Jeep Wagoneer, the old kind of Jeep Wagoneer, or you had a Jeep CJ5 in the desert with big tires on it. And uh, so we did that for a year. It was pretty exciting. About three months into it, the other Marine officer and I decided this will be safe enough for our family. So I flew my wife and two children over. We got a special deal through the Naval Attaché, U.S. Naval Attaché in, in Amman, Jordan. He could get cheap tickets. So I flew my wife Sarah over to Copenhagen and then down to Amman, Jordan, and picked her up at the airport in Amman, which was very foreign to her. But the way they do business over there, it's who you know. So I wore my uniform, my Marine Corps captain's uniform, and I went into the uh, airport and I said, who's in charge of security here? And they said, it's Major whatever he is. And I went up and it just so happened that he had gone to the Marine Corps Captain School in the United States. When he saw me, he said, whatever you need, I'll. So he and I went to the plane when it landed and were waiting when she got off the plane. It's pretty neat. So, and we had the two kids and they were just in shell shock because surrounding the aircraft were all these guys with kafias on and it was pretty scary for her. But we, we lived in, uh, Jerusalem for a year, and uh, it was a real unique experience. Then we came back, and uh, where did I go? Oh, I went back to Quantico, Virginia. I was an instructor at the uh, Marine Corps Officer School for three years. I was a company commander of Marines, the same school I had gone through, and then uh, after that tour, I'm trying to keep all these tours straight. Um, about what, what, what year were we talking about? We're, this is about 1976 through 78. Okay. 79. Okay. So the Marine Corps opened up the intelligence field as an, a field for unrestricted officers before they had used limited duty officers in the MOS. So five of us, again, were picked to go into the field. That was one of those. So they sent me to a one-year school in Washington, D.C., Defense Intelligence School at DIA. So went to that school, did pretty well. And then I went back to 2nd Marine Division. I had been in 2nd Marine Division before as a battery commander. And then before I went to Vietnam. So it was my, our third tour in the in, uh, second marine division but i worked for the g2 who was uh colonel carl mundy who was later destined to be commandant of the marine corps he died last year as a matter of fact it was fun working for general for colonel mundy then at the time because he was such a great guy to work for um, so um did that two-year tour and then I was selected to go to Marine Corps Command and Staff College. I went back to Quantico, you know, the home of all Marines, I guess, and went to the one-year school. And because I'd been in Israel, we had an Israeli officer who, and his family who needed a sponsor, so we decided to sponsor them. Well, this was uh, Colonel Shaul Mofaz, and Mofaz later became the Chief of Staff of the Israeli Defense Force. And the Minister of Defense. So there's more to this story. Hope I'm not boring you. Okay, so um, we became good friends with him. We helped him buy a car and get a place to live on base and, uh, and our wives became very good friends. As a matter of fact, our youngest son and their daughter said they were gonna be married someday, but it didn't work out. <laughs> so um, 
so that was a good one year tour and uh where'd we go next oh yeah i was assigned uh, to a marine amphibious brigade planning staff at norfolk we were we worked for the fleet commander we had a brigadier general and guess who the brigadier general turned out to be it was general brigadier general carl mundy second time i worked for him so we were on the on a navy ship and uh we did landings in in uh, northern europe mainly winter exercises in northern norway that's where we went so we we had three winters we went up and trained in northern norway learned how to survive in the cold did a lot of cross-country skiing and i asked myself at times I, am I really getting paid to do this? This is a lot of fun. Although I left my poor wife at home with three teenagers, four teenagers. Drove, she, I hope I've made it up to her. So, um, yeah, we were in Norway, Denmark. Um, spent some time working with the Royal Marines in Britain and in Germany. We did some exercises in northern Germany in the Schleswig-Holstein state, which is in northern Germany. Along uh, Kiel is there. So got to know kind of Northern Europe a lot and started, uh, started running a lot. These guys on the, the Marine Brigade staff said, okay, we're all gonna run the Marine Corps Marathon together. And so we trained to do that and I've been running ever since. That kind of got it for me. So we would take our running stuff and we would run in these European cities. And we, it was really fun. And this last year, my brother-in-law and I hiked across England this last summer. And I went back to Hyde Park, where I had run around as a major in the Marine Corps 30 years ago. And I ran some of the same places. It was very nostalgic. It hadn't changed very much at all. So um, that was a fun tour. And uh, I kind of hated to leave. Well, you know, we'd go out on a Navy ship occasionally. And I uh, got to kind of get the Navy perspective on things, which was good. Then after that, I got selected to go to the Naval War College. Initially selected to go to the Indian Defense College in Delhi for a year. But I had not been promoted to colonel yet. And they wouldn't brevet. Do you know, to, to brevet means you're not really a colonel yet, but the, you're just pretending to be a colonel. So they wouldn't brevet me. They sent, and I wanted to go, and my wife wanted to go. She's very adventurous. But they sent an aviator, a pilot, whose wife didn't want to go, and he didn't want to go. So it, I thought the Marine Corps made a big mistake there. But they sent us to the Naval War College in Newport for a year, which was very nice. We had to work hard, though. It was a tough school. Got a master's degree, but uh, did a lot of writing. And what, I wrote a paper about an 80-page paper on comparing the uh, intelligence organization of the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force in World War II and how that would apply to a Marine Corps aviation unit. And so I uh, had a choice of my next duty station, and I had been selected for colonel. So no colonel had ever made Brigadier General in the Marine Corps in the intelligence field. It was still new. And so I said, I'm at the end of my road here. I'm just going to pick a duty station that's going to be fun, and maybe I can contribute something. So I went to the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing, the first real colonel intel guy they had ever had there, and walked into the general's office, put that paper on his desk, and I said, I'd like to do this in the wing. The next day he called me down, and he had big red ink across there. Go ahead and do it. And so we tried to do it. So I got some really neat training, got to go out to uh, Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron and get trained. Then I went to the Naval Strike Warfare Center at Fallon, Nevada, and got trained there, and then came back and I, I could speak pilot. I knew what the pilots wanted. So I had a couple years there. I made some aviators mad who had been used to doing things the wrong way, but I had the general's backing. And uh, so I was the G2 of the wing, the intelligence officer. So in 1990, the summer of 1990, 
it looked like the Iraqis were massing forces on the Kuwait border. And I have to tell you that we were getting no indications of the probability of that from our official intelligence sources. I was really kind of me. So I'm listening to national public radio one morning in August, and they said, Iraqi forces have crossed the Kuwait border and are heading toward Kuwait City. NPR. I, I ran into the office. There wasn't much traffic on this at all. I called the general. I said, they are going into Kuwait. And so um, we spun up for that. The whole Marine Corps spun up for that. We started sending units over and everything. But the wing itself didn't go. Uh, we were sending a few squadrons over. But um, my boss was uh, General Richard Herney, who was a two-star. He had his own DC-9. So he said, we're going to go in my plane. So he became the deputy to the Marine forces in, in Kuwait, uh, not in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, actually. And so he took me along and he said, okay, you're going to be the assistant to the G2 of Marine forces. You'll be back. The G2 will be forward and you've got to keep them, give them enough information to keep them going. So I knew what pilots wanted, and we, I had a lot of assets I took with me, two entire platoons of imagery interpreters, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. And so I bartered them off to the Air Force. I, we would get our foot, I'd go eat lunch with the Air Force intelligence officer in Riyadh. It turns out, he was also a Florida State graduate. And so we would say, I'll give you a platoon of imagery interpreters if you give us the feedback from this such and such a system. And so we kind of bartered things around. And they had all sorts of national and theater type intelligence systems working. So we kind of, we scratched each other's back and it worked. And so uh, came time for the ground conflict. The Marines uh, went through faster than the Army thought they were going to go through. And one of the funny things was the Army had all these Army Rangers, the guys with the big arms, wearing all the special equipment. They were going to rappel into the embassy. They'd have been, they were going to seize the embassy. Well, the funny thing about it was when they rappelled down, there was a squad of Marines sitting around the swimming pool of the embassy eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Marines had already made it in there. General Schwarzkopf was not happy with that because <laughs> he wanted the Army to do that. Marines had moved, really moved fast up there. So uh, had a major who had worked for me, and he was the S-2 of one of the Marine regiments. So every week I would fly up to the Ford headquarters and... Uh, and take a bunch of stuff, including a big sack of Coca-Colas and candy. So I became really popular. So one story, I guess I can tell you this story. General Herney, I saw General Herney. And out in the desert, they, they had everything well camouflaged, but they had a hole dug in the ground, and it said urinal. And so uh, it was just a sandy hole in the ground, maybe 10 feet deep. And so uh, I'm going to be improper here. That's fine. I was relieving myself in the urinal, standing on the edge of this precipice with this sign stuck in the ground. General Herney came up beside me and said, Hey, Dave, how are you doing? I said, Hey, General, how are you? He said, Have you heard we're going home? And I said, No. He said, Yeah, as soon as we fill this hole up with piss. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> ridiculous. So... Um, <laughs> The ground war went faster. Remember they set all the oil wells ablaze? Yep. So we flew, the, the general I worked for back in the rear was a helicopter pilot, so I flew with him up there and we were flying in between these big geysers of, uh, I mean there were pools of oil with dead camels in them. It was a real mess. So they brought in all these companies from uh, the United States, like Red Adair, these guys who yep. capped yep. exploding oil wells. 
and they brought in the one we were associated with is called Boots and Coots. They were these guys from Texas. And uh, the estimate in the morning brief was, it's going to take them a year to do this. So I talked to this good old boy from Texas with boots and uh, Levi's, you know, and a cowboy hat. He said, we'll have this done in two months. Who are they trying to kid? And they did. They did it in like two months, had it all cleaned up. So um, I flew up there one day, and we got with the 2nd Marine Division commander, and he gave us kind of a tour. We, we drove around his area, and we're driving down this road, and standing beside the road is this major who used to work for me. His name was Mick Koshevsky, a good Catholic boy from up northeast. And I said, Mick, how are you doing? He said, hey, uh, Colonel, come on, I'll give you a ride in my tank. He had a captured T-62 tank that he was driving around. And I said, well, no, I don't really have time for that. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. It's great to see you again. So we, we took off. That's the last time I saw him. And uh, the other part of this story is he was later killed in a helicopter crash. And, and I knew him pretty well, and we had gone out as couples, he and his wife, and me and my wife back in Virginia Beach. And so the years went by, and uh, wow, I had a dream. It was like 10 years later after he had been killed. And uh, I was riding through the desert in that vehicle, and Mick was standing beside the road. And I said, I don't know what I said to him, but he said, tell everybody I'm fine. And then the dream was over. And so I called headquarters Marine Corps, and they're not supposed to give you phone numbers of widows. But I said, look, this is really important. I'm on the up and up here. I just have a message for his wife. So I called her. She was living up in the Northeast. And I said, I know you remember me. Uh, I remember you. I just want to tell you about this dream I had about it. I said, Mix told me that he was fine. She teared up, of course. She said, I want you to call his parents. Here's his parents' number. And call them. Mm -hmm. So I called them. So I guess Mick really is fine. Um, Captain Williams, my company commander in Vietnam, came back in 1984. The last time I saw him was at the Marine Corps Ball. I introduced him to my wife, and uh, he still walked with a little limp. But he developed sepsis septicemia, which is blood poisoning. And he went into the Portsmouth Naval Hospital. I was at a staff meeting on the ship the next morning. It was this, this is a, that tour I had with the Navy. And uh, somebody said, I don't know whether you heard, but Joe Williams died yesterday. And I went, what? What happened? He was in a real weakened condition, and they anesthetized him to uh, take out some shell fragments from his arm. And they couldn't bring him back. He went into shock and died. So I went back. I was on the ship. I wrote an eight-page handwritten letter to his wife, tr trying to remember everything that had happened in Vietnam with him and how much I admired him and everything. I got a really nice letter back from her. But she remarried. She married a British officer and moved to England, Royal Navy mm -hmm. officer. So, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> we came back from Desert Storm. Uh, it was a, kind of a strange trip back. I won't go into all the details, but it was pretty bizarre. You just had to catch a plane back. There was so much traffic going back and forth. We flew into Maine, and then we, uh, I went down to the 2nd Marine Air Wing, and the G3 of the wing the operations officer and my wife were standing at an empty airfield. I was one of the first ones back, and, and we saw them. And uh, so we were back. So my tour ended there. My last tour was at U.S. Central Command in Tampa, which is a joint command. That means you have people, you're working with Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and civilians. And so I was the uh, director of the Joint Intelligence Center at U.S. Central Command. I worked for a, a wonderful officer who became the head of DIA, and that's uh, General Pat Hughes. And I really enjoyed that tour, but you never saw the light of day. I mean, I was in there at 6, 
I was leaving it uh, like seven or eight at night, seven days a week. It was really very demanding. And then uh, that tour was up in 1993, and uh, the Commandant sent out a letter to all colonels. There are only about 400 colonels in the Marine Corps. He said, if you're not going to be promoted Brigadier General, so that I will not have to do like the Army and the Navy and send out pink slips. He said, if you can, consider retiring instead of growing old as a colonel. And so the list of Brigadier Generals came out. I was at a, a big meeting around a big table, and they handed a message around to me, and my name wasn't on the list. And so I wrote back, I passed it back to General Hughes. I went, I'm out of here. I had <laughs> passed it back to him. So I retired after 25 years. And it was a, I, I just was so fortunate to have a wonderful career, an exciting career. The Marine Corps was so good to us. And our children, our, my wife, uh, did not want me to retire, really. She loved it. She was the kind of gal who could climb Mount Sinai at night and see the sun come up and when she did that. And she was pregnant. Hmm. Or swim in the Red Sea. Or um, take a train up to Haifa from Jerusalem with a bunch of Arabs and Palestinians. She, she did all that. So she was adventuresome and she uh, was a great Marine wife. And uh, so we, I was, I interviewed with a couple of companies in Tampa and uh, since I have a biology degree, I had a very promising job offer from, uh, what's the big hearing aid company? I can't think of the name of it. They wanted to hire me in Tampa and I passed that up. And I got a call from headquarters of Marine Corps and it said, uh, have you considered Marine Corps Junior ROTC? You'll be paid your active duty pay as a colonel. You'll be in a high school you'll be teaching young kids. And I said, sounds pretty good. Well, we're going to start a unit in Coweta County, Georgia at, a, at East Coweta High School. So we, we moved up here. I took the job. The principal had been a Marine in Vietnam, Marine rifleman, sergeant in Vietnam. He said, boy, we'll hire you today. And so I was there for 15 years running Marine Corps Junior ROTC. And then I decided they needed a science teacher, and uh, al although I had a BA in biology, not a BS with the education degree, I had a lot of science classes, I had to qualify as a teacher. And so I took a one-year supervised practicum, took a bunch of exams, they were sure that I could teach. And I taught biology for four years, but I was the senior class sponsor for 15 years and ran graduation, was the cross-country coach. And they were very good to us there, really great. So we, I retired from there two years ago. And uh, that's the end of the story. But um, still at heart, I'm a Marine. And uh, it's a great honor to lead and be with Marines. It's a great honor. Whenever I see one in the airport, they, you notice they do not wear their utility uniforms in the airport. If you see a Marine, he's in civilian clothes but I can spot them a mile away. So I always go up and shake their hand and talk to them, even especially the young ones in the airport. And uh, keep, keep in touch with a lot of Marine Corps friends. Mm -hmm. but, what are you doing now? I am uh, I'm in the, her church, and uh, I'm a volunteer. I serve in the presidency of the Atlanta Mormon Temple. And it's a full-time job. The only pay are the blessings you get. But we, we stay in an apartment in Sandy Springs during the week and uh, then go home on the weekends to make sure our home's still standing down in Noonan. So that's what we do. We're, we do volunteer work. And we visit grandkids. Tomorrow we're flying to Vancouver, British Columbia. We have a son who graduated from Georgia Tech. He's got his Ph.D., and he lives in Vancouver. He's a computer guy. So we have a son there. We have a son in Ohio. We have a son who's a CPA in Cumming, Georgia. Works downtown here. And we have a daughter in Cumming. And they're 
They've all graduated from college and we have 14 grandchildren. The oldest is 20, that's Sam, and the youngest, Henry, is in Vancouver. He's a Canadian, three years old. So that's our family. And we, last week I went to my high school luncheon in Florida and there is a picture of me as a Cub Scout back in the 50s on the steps of the Methodist Church in that little town. And uh, most, of, most of my Cub Scout buddies have passed away. Surprise, I'm 69. That's pretty young, yeah. But a lot of these guys are gone. I visited the widow of one who was with me when we went aboard the Navy ship, Larry Noble. He was also at 13 or 14. So I visited his wife and went to the luncheon and saw a bunch of old friends, including one boy I used to play with. We became friends at age five. We played in the mud together as kids. And uh, he was there. We were born one day apart. So I saw him last week and drove back. But. So uh, life this is a dangerous thing to say. Life has been good to us so far. And the Marine Corps was a wonderful career. Still in my heart, no doubt about it. So uh, that about wraps it up. Well, you have a wonderful really? story. Thank you. And uh, you tell it well. Thanks. And uh, gee, I didn't have anything to do. I have a question for you. What, what is your yes. question? I know we've kept you too long, but I do have no. one quick question. Okay. Kuwait Liberation Medal. Yeah. That's what everybody got who was over there in the Marine United Corps. Nations Truce Supervision Officer, 75 to 76. Yeah, that's that was when you That's when you were in uh, okay. Palestine and Palestine. Israel. Gotcha. gotcha. Man. Okay. So we got to go to some pretty exciting places. Most people don't get to go to. You did. My wife has been to downtown Damascus. How many people can say that? Do we not? Many people can say that. Well, you were in intelligence in Desert Storm when my husband was in intelligence yeah. in Desert Storm. So I'm, I've always been very curious about that. So I'm surprised your paths didn't cross. He was in. Uh, he was in Crete, see the bay, Crete. Oh yeah, no, I was a long way from Crete. Although we landed in Crete on the way over there. A lot of rocks. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the runway has rocks right beside it. Huge rocks. And uh, we have been swimming in the Dead Sea, the Med, the Red Sea, the Pacific, the Atlantic. So I got got. Just about. Covered. Never been to Australia. Uh, but been to Africa. Got to go to Colombia, one time. Didn't talk about that. Got to go to Panama, um, all over Europe. Went out on a Sunday to the Battle of Waterloo, the site of Battle of Waterloo, which is not in Waterloo, by the way. Right. And um, did a lot of running around Hamburg, Germany. But hey, it was great. It's wonderful. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you very thank much. You. It's been a pleasure. And Please. thank you for coming today. Do you have any questions? It's fun. Yeah. And Semper Fi. Thank you for coming. Semper Fidelis. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right.